Chapter Two The Robbery in Fillimore Terrace of The Old Man in the Corner by Baroness Orzee. Whether Miss Polly Burton really did expect to see the man in the corner that Saturday afternoon, twere difficult to say. Certain it is that when she found her way to the table close by the window and realized that he was not there, she felt conscious of an overwhelming sense of disappointment. And yet during the whole of the week she had, with more pride than wisdom, avoided this particular ABC shop. "'I thought you would not keep away very long,' said a quiet voice close to her ear. She nearly lost her balance. Where in the world had he come from? She certainly had not heard the slightest sound, and yet there he sat in the corner, like a veritable jack-in-the-box, his mild blue eyes staring apologetically at her, his nervous fingers toying with the inevitable bit of string. The waitress brought him his glass of milk and a cheesecake. He ate it in silence, while his piece of string lay idly beside him on the table. When he had finished, he fumbled in his capacious pockets and drew out the inevitable pocketbook. Placing a small photograph before the girl, he said quietly, That is the back of the houses in Fillimore Terrace, which overlook Adam and Eve views. She looked at the photograph, then at him, with a kindly look of indulgent expectancy. You will notice that the row of back gardens have each an exit into the mews. These mews are built in the shape of a capital F. The photograph is taken, looking straight down the short horizontal line, which ends, as you see, in a cul-de-sac. The bottom of the vertical line turns into Fillimore Terrace, and the end of the upper long horizontal line into High Street, Kensington. Now, on that particular night, or rather early morning, of January 15th, Constable D-21, having turned into the mews from Fillimore Terrace, stood for a moment at the angle formed by the long vertical artery of the mews and the short horizontal one which, as I observed before, looks onto the back gardens of the terrace houses and ends in a cul-de-sac. How long D-21 stood at that particular corner he could not exactly say, but he thinks it must have been three or four minutes before he noticed a suspicious-looking individual shambling along under the shadow of the garden walls. He was working his way cautiously in the direction of the cul-de-sac, and D-21, also keeping well within the shadow, went noiselessly after him. He had almost overtaken him, was, in fact, not more than thirty yards from him, when from out of one of the two end houses, number 22 Fillimore Terrace, in fact, a man, in nothing but his nightshirt, rushed out excitedly, and, before D-21 had time to intervene, literally threw himself upon the suspected individual, rolling over and over with him on the hard cobblestones, and frantically shrieking, Thief! Thief! Police! It was some time before the constable succeeded in rescuing the tramp from the excited grip of his assailant, and several minutes before he could make himself heard. There, there, that'll do, he managed to say at last. He gave the man in the shirt a vigorous shove, which silenced him for the moment. Leave the man alone now. You mustn't make that noise this time of night, waking up all the folks. The unfortunate tramp, who, in the meanwhile, had managed to get onto his feet again, made no attempt to get away. Probably he thought he would stand but a poor chance but the man in the shirt had partly recovered his power of speech, and was now blurting out jerky, half-intelligible sentences. "'I have been robbed! Robbed! I! That is, my master, Mr. Knopf! The desk is open! The diamond's gone! All in my charge! And now they are stolen! That's the thief! I'll swear! I heard him, not three minutes ago! Rush downstairs! The door into the garden was smashed! I ran across the garden! He was sneaking about here still! Thief! Thief! Police! Diamonds! Constable! Don't let him go! I'll make you responsible if you let him go. Now then, that'll do, admonished D-21, as soon as he could get a word in. Stop that row, will you? The man in the shirt was gradually recovering from his excitement. Can I give this man in charge? he asked. What for? Burglary and housebreaking. I heard him, I tell you. He must have Mr. Knopf's diamonds about him at this moment. Where is Mr. Knopf? Out of town, groaned the man in the shirt. He went to Brighton last night, and left me in charge, and now this thief has been, and— The tramp shrugged his shoulders, and suddenly, without a word, he quietly began taking off his coat and waistcoat. These he handed across to the constable. Eagerly the man in the shirt fell on them, and turned the ragged pockets inside out. From one of the windows a hilarious voice made some facetious remark, as the tramp with equal solemnity began divesting himself of his nether garments. "'Now then, stop that nonsense!' pronounced D-21 severely, 
What were you doing here this time of night, anyway? The streets of London is free to the public, ain't they? queried the tramp. This don't lead nowhere, my man. Then I've lost my way, that's all, growled the man surly, and perhaps you'll let me get along now. By this time a couple of constables had appeared upon the scene. D-21 had no intention of losing sight of his friend the tramp, and the man in the shirt had again made a dash for the latter's collar at the bare idea that he should be allowed to get along. I think D-21 was alive to the humor of the situation. He suggested that Robertson, the man in the nightshirt, should go in and get some clothes on, whilst he himself would wait for the inspector and the detective, whom D-15 would send round from the station immediately. Poor Robertson's teeth were chattering with cold. He had a violent fit of sneezing as D-21 hurried him into the house. The latter, with another constable, remained to watch the burglared premises from back and front, and D-15 took the wretched tramp to the station, with a view to sending an inspector and a detective round immediately. When the two latter gentlemen arrived at number 22, Fillimore Terrace, they found poor old Robertson in bed, shivering and still quite blue. He had got himself a hot drink, but his eyes were streaming and his voice was terribly husky. D-21 had stationed himself in the dining-room, where Robertson had pointed the desk out to him, with its broken lock and scattered contents. Robertson, between his sneezes, gave what account he could of the events which happened immediately before the robbery. His master, Mr. Ferdinand Knopf, he said, was a diamond merchant and a bachelor. He himself had been in Mr. Knopf's employ for over fifteen years, and was his only indoor servant. A charwoman came every day to do the housework. Last night, Mr. Knopf, dined at the house of Mr. Shipman, at number 26, lower down. Mr. Shipman is the great jeweller who has his place of business in South Audley Street. By the last post there was a letter with the Brighton postmark, and marked urgent, for Mr. Knopf, and he, Robertson, was just wondering if he should run over to number 26 with it when his master returned. He gave one glance at the contents of the letter, asked for his ABC railway guide, and ordered him, Robertson, to pack his bag at once and fetch him a cab. "'I guessed what it was,' continued Robertson, after another violent fit of sneezing. "'Mr. Knopf has a brother, Mr. Emil Knopf, to whom he is very much attached, and who is a great invalid. He generally goes about from one seaside place to another. He is now at Brighton, and has recently been very ill. If you will take the trouble to go downstairs, I think you will still find the letter lying on the hall table.' "'I read it after Mr. Knopf left. It was not from his brother, but from a gentleman who signed himself J. Collins, M.D.' I don't remember the exact words, but, of course, you'll be able to read the letter. Mr. J. Collins said he had been called in very suddenly to see Mr. Emil Knopf, who, he added, had not many more hours to live, and had begged of the doctor to communicate at once with his brother in London. Before leaving, Mr. Knopf warned me that there were some valuables in his desk, diamonds mostly, and told me to be particularly careful about locking up the house. He often has left me like this in charge of his premises, and usually there have been diamonds in his desk for Mr. Knopf has no regular city office, as he is a commercial traveller. This, briefly, was the gist of the matter which Robertson related to the inspector, with many repetitions and persistent volubility. The detective and inspector, before returning to the station with their report, thought they would call at number 26 on Mr. Shipman, the great jeweller. "'You remember, of course,' added the man in the corner, dreamily contemplating his bit of string, the exciting developments of this extraordinary case. Mr. Arthur Shipman is the head of the firm of Shipman and Company, the wealthy jewellers. He is a widower, and lives very quietly by himself, in his own old-fashioned way, in the small Kensington house, leaving it to his two married sons to keep up the style and swagger befitting the representatives of so wealthy a firm. "'I have only known Mr. Knopf for a very little while,' he explained to the detectives. "'He sold me two or three stones once or twice, I think, but we are both single men, and we have often dined together.' Last night he dined with me. He had that afternoon received a very fine consignment of Brazilian diamonds, as he told me, and knowing how beset I am with callers at my business place, he had brought the stones with him, hoping, perhaps, to do a bit of trade over the nuts and wine. I bought twenty-five thousand pounds worth of him, added the jeweller, as if he were speaking of so many farthings, and gave him a check across the dinner table for that amount. I think we were both pleased with our bargain, and we had a final bottle of forty-eight port over it together. Mr. Knopf left me at about nine-thirty, for he knows I go very early to bed, and I took my new stock upstairs with me and locked it up in the safe. I certainly heard nothing of the noise in the mews last night. I sleep on the second floor, 
in front of the house, and this is the first I have heard of poor Mr. Knopf's loss. At this point of his narrative, Mr. Shipman very suddenly paused, and his face became very pale. With a hasty word of excuse, he unceremoniously left the room, and the detective heard him running quickly upstairs. Less than two minutes later, Mr. Shipman returned. There was no need for him to speak. Both the detective and the inspector guessed the truth in a moment by the look upon his face. The diamonds, he gasped, I have been robbed. Now I must tell you, continued the man in the corner, that after I had read the account of the double robbery, which appeared in the early afternoon papers, I set to work and had a good think. Yes, he added with a smile, noting Polly's look at the bit of string on which he was still at work. Yes, aided by this small adjunct to continued thought, I made notes as to how I should proceed to discover the clever thief, who had carried off a small fortune in a single night. Of course, my methods are not those of a London detective. He has his own way of going to work. The one who was conducting the case questioned the unfortunate jeweler very closely about his servants and his household generally. I have three servants, explained Mr. Shipman, two of whom have been with me for many years. One, the housemaid, is a fairly newcomer. She has been here about six months. She came recommended by a friend and bore an excellent character. She and the parlor maid room together. The cook, who knew me when I was a schoolboy, sleeps alone. All three servants sleep on the floor above. I locked the jewels up in the safe which stands in the dressing room. My keys and watch I placed, as usual, beside my bed. As a rule, I am a fairly light sleeper. I cannot understand how it could have happened, but you had better come up and have a look at the safe. The key must have been abstracted from my bedside, the safe opened, and the keys replaced, all while I was fast asleep. Though I had no occasion to look into the safe until just now, I should have discovered my loss before going to business, for I intended to take the diamonds away with me. The detective and the inspector went up to have a look at the safe. The lock had in no way been tampered with. It had been opened with its own key. The detective spoke of chloroform, but Mr. Shipman declared that when he woke in the morning at about half-past seven, there was no smell of chloroform in the room. However, the proceedings of the daring thief certainly pointed to the use of an anesthetic. An examination of the premises brought to light the fact that the burglar had, as in Mr. Knopf's house, used the glass panel door from the garden as a means of entrance. But in this instance, he had carefully cut out the pane of glass with a diamond, slipped the bolts, turned the key, and walked in. "'Which among your servants knew that you had diamonds in your house last night, Mr. Shipman?' asked the detective. "'Not one, I should say,' replied the jeweler. "'Though, perhaps, the parlour-maid, whilst waiting at table, may have heard me and Mr. Knopf discussing our bargain. "'Would you object to my searching all your servants' boxes?' "'Certainly not. They would not object either, I am sure. They are perfectly honest.' "'The searching of servants' belongings is invariably a useless proceeding,' added the man in the corner, with a shrug of the shoulders. "'Not one, not even a latter-day domestic, would be fool enough to keep stolen property in the house. However, the usual farce was gone through, with more or less protest on the part of Mr. Shipman's servants, and with the usual results. The jeweler could give no further information. The detective and the inspector, to do them justice, did their work of investigation minutely, and, what is more, intelligently. It seemed evident from their deductions that the burglar had commenced proceedings on number 26 Fillimore Terrace, and had then gone on, probably climbing over the garden walls between the houses to number 22, where he was almost caught in the act by Robertson. The facts were simple enough, but the mystery remained as to the individual who had managed to glean the information of the presence of the diamonds in both the houses, and the means with which he had adopted to get that information. It was obvious that the thief or thieves knew more about Mr. Knopf's affairs than Mr. Shipman's, since they had known how to use Mr. Emil Knopf's name in order to get his brother out of the way. It was now nearly ten o'clock, and the detectives, having taken leave of Mr. Shipman, went back to number 22, in order to ascertain whether Mr. Knopf had come back. The door was opened by the old charwoman, who said that her master had returned and was having some breakfast in the dining room. Mr. Ferdinand Knopf was a middle-aged man with sallow complexion, black hair and beard, of obvious Hebrew extraction. He spoke with a marked foreign accent, but very courteously, to the two officials, who he begged would excuse him if he went on with his breakfast. I was fully prepared to hear the bad news, he explained, which my man Robertson told me when I arrived. The letter I got last night was a bogus one. There is no such person as J. Collins, M.D. My brother had never felt better in his life. You will, I am sure, very soon trace the cunning writer of that epistle. Ah! but I was in a rage, I can tell you, 
when I got to the Metropole at Brighton and found that Emile, my brother, had never heard of any Dr. Collins. The last train to town had gone, although I raced back to the station as hard as I could. Poor old Robertson, he has a terrible cold. Ah, yes, my loss. It is for me a very serious one. If I had not made that lucky bargain with Mr. Shipman last night, I should, perhaps, at this moment be a ruined man. The stones I had yesterday were, firstly, some magnificent Brazilians. These I sold to Mr. Shipman, mostly. Then I had some very good Cape diamonds, all gone, and some quite special Parisians, of wonderful work and finish, entrusted me to sale by a great French house. I tell you, sir, my loss will be nearly ten thousand pounds altogether. I sell on commission, and, of course, have to make good the loss. He was evidently trying to bear up manfully, and as a businessman should, under his sad fate, he refused in any way to attach the slightest blame to his old and faithful servant Robertson, who had caught, perhaps, his death of a cold, in his zeal for his absent master. As for any hint of suspicion falling even remotely upon the man, the very idea appeared to Mr. Knopf absolutely preposterous. With regard to the old charwoman, Mr. Knopf certainly knew nothing about her, beyond the fact that she had been recommended to him by one of the tradespeople in the neighborhood, and seemed perfectly honest, respectable, and sober. About the tramp, Mr. Knopf knew still less, nor could he imagine how he, or in fact anybody else, could possibly know that he happened to have diamonds in his house that night. This certainly seemed to be the great hitch in the case. Mr. Ferdinand Knopf, at the instance of the police, later on went to the station and had a look at the suspected tramp. He declared that he had never set eyes on him before. Mr. Shipman, on his way home from business in the afternoon, had done likewise and made a similar statement. Brought before the magistrate, the tramp gave but a poor account of himself. He gave a name and address, which latter, of course, proved to be false. After that, he absolutely refused to speak. He seemed not to care whether he was kept in custody or not. Very soon, even the police realized that, for the present at any rate, nothing could be got out of the suspected tramp. Mr. Francis Howard, the detective who had charge of the case, though he would not admit it even to himself, was at his wit's ends. You must remember that the burglary, through its very simplicity, was an exceedingly mysterious affair. The constable, D-21, who had stood in Adam and Eve Mews, presumably while Mr. Knopf's house was being robbed, had seen no one turn out from the cul-de-sac into the main passage of the Mews. The stables, which immediately faced the back entrance of Phillimore Terrace houses, were all private ones belonging to residents in the neighborhood. The coachmen, their families, and all the grooms who slept in the stablings were rigidly watched and questioned. One and all had seen nothing, heard nothing, until Robinson's shrieks had roused them from their sleep. As for the letter from Brighton, it was absolutely commonplace, and written upon note-paper which the detective, with Machiavellian cunning, traced to a stationer's shop in West Street. But the trade at that particular shop was a very brisk one. Scores of people had bought note-paper there, similar to that on which the supposed doctor had written his tricky letter. The handwriting was cramped, perhaps a disguised one, in any case, except under very exceptional circumstances, it could afford no clue to the identity of the thief. Needless to say, the tramp, when told to write his name, wrote a totally different and absolutely uneducated hand. Matters stood, however, in the same persistently mysterious state when a small discovery was made which suggested to Mr. Francis Howard an idea which, if properly carried out, would, he hoped, inevitably bring the cunning burglar safely within the grasp of the police. That was the discovery of a few of Mr. Knopf's diamonds, continued the man in the corner, after a slight pause, evidently trampled into the ground by the thief whilst making his hurried exit through the garden of No. 22, Phillimore Terrace. At the end of this garden there was a small studio, which had been built by a former owner of the house, and behind it a small piece of waste ground about seven feet square, which had once been a rookery, and is still filled with large loose stones, in the shadow of which earwigs and woodlice innumerable, have made a happy hunting ground. It was Robertson who, two days after the robbery, having need of a large stone for some household purpose or other, dislodged one from that piece of waste ground, and found a few shining pebbles beneath it. Mr. Knopf took them round to the police station himself immediately, and identified the stones as some of his Parisian ones. Later on, the detective went to view the place where the find had been made, and there conceived the plan upon which he built big, cherished hopes. Acting upon the advice of Mr. Francis Howard, the police decided to let the anonymous tramp out of his safe retreat within the station, and to allow him to wander whithersoever he chose. A good idea, perhaps, the presumption being that, sooner or later, 
If the man was in any way mixed up with the cunning thieves, he would either rejoin his comrades, or even lead the police to where the remnant of his hoard lay hidden. Needless to say, his footsteps were to be literally dogged. The wretched tramp on his discharge wandered out of the yard, wrapping his thin coat round his shoulders, for it was a bitterly cold afternoon. He began operations by turning into the town hall tavern for a good feed and a copious drink. Mr. Francis Howard noted that he seemed to eye every passer-by with suspicion, but he seemed to enjoy his dinner and sat some time over his bottle of wine. It was close upon four o'clock when he left the tavern, and then began for the indefatigable Mr. Howard one of the most wearisome and uninteresting chases through the mazes of the London streets he ever remembers to have made. Up Notting Hill, down the slums of Notting Dale, along the High Street, beyond Hammersmith, and through Shepherd's Bush did that anonymous tramp lead the unfortunate detective, never hurrying himself, stopping every now and then at a public house to get a drink, whither Mr. Howard did not always care to follow him. In spite of his fatigue, Mr. Francis Howard's hopes rose with every half hour of this weary tramp. The man was obviously striving to kill time. He seemed to feel no weariness, but walked on and on, perhaps suspecting that he was being followed. At last, with a beating heart, though half perished with cold, and with terribly sore feet, the detective began to realize that the tramp was gradually working his way back towards Kensington. It was then close upon eleven o'clock at night. Once or twice the man had walked up and down the high street, from St. Paul's School to Derry and Tom's shops, and back again. He had looked down one or two of the side streets, and, at last, he turned into Fillimore Terrace. He seemed in no hurry. He even stopped once in the middle of the road, trying to light a pipe, which, as there was a high east wind, took him some considerable time. Then he leisurely sauntered down the street, and turned into Adam and Eve Mews, with Mr. Francis Howard now close at his heels. Acting upon the detective's instructions, there were several men in plain clothes, ready to his call in the immediate neighborhood. Two stood within the shadow of the steps of the Congregational Church at the corner of the mews, others were stationed well within a soft call. Hardly, therefore, had the hare turned into the cul-de-sac at the back of Fillimore Terrace, than, at a slight sound from Mr. Francis Howard, every egress was barred to him, and he was caught like a rat in a trap. As soon as the tramp had advanced some thirty yards or so, the whole length of this part of the mews is about one hundred yards, and was lost in the shadow, Mr. Francis Howard directed four or five of his men to proceed cautiously up the mews, whilst the same number were to form a line all along the front of Fillimore Terrace, between the mews and the high street. Remember, the back garden walls threw long and dense shadows, but the silhouette of the man would be clearly outlined if he made any attempt at climbing over them. Mr. Howard felt quite sure that the thief was bent on recovering the stolen goods, which, no doubt, he had hidden in the rear of one of the houses. He would be caught in flagrant delicto, and with a heavy sentence hovering over him, he would probably be induced to name his accomplice. Mr. Francis Howard was thoroughly enjoying himself. The minutes sped on. Absolute silence, in spite of the presence of so many men, reigned in the dark and deserted mews. Of course, this night's adventure was never allowed to get into the papers, added the man in the corner with his mild smile. Had the plan been successful, we should have heard all about it with a long eulogistic article as to the astuteness of our police. But as it was, well, the tramp sauntered up the mews, and there he remained for aught Mr. Francis Howard or the other constables could ever explain. The earth or the shadows swallowed him up. No one saw him climb one of the garden walls. No one heard him break open a door. He had retreated within the shadow of the garden walls and was seen or heard of no more. One of the servants in the Fillimore Terrace houses must have belonged to the gang said Polly, with quick decision. "'Ah, yes, but which?' said the man in the corner, making a beautiful knot in his bit of string. "'I can assure you that the police left not a stone unturned once more to catch sight of that tramp whom they had had in custody for two days, but not a trace of him could they find, nor of the diamonds, from that day to this.' "'The tramp was missing,' continued the old man in the corner, and Mr. Francis Howard tried to find the missing tramp. Going round to the front and seeing the lights at number 26 still in, he called upon Mr. Shipman. The jeweler had had a few friends to dinner, and was giving them whiskies and sodas before saying good night. The servants had just finished washing up and were waiting to go to bed. Neither they nor Mr. Shipman nor his guests had seen or heard anything of the suspicious individual. Mr. Francis Howard went on to see Mr. Ferdinand Knopf. This gentleman was having his warm bath, preparatory to going to bed, so Robertson told the detective. 
However, Mr. Knopf insisted on talking to Mr. Howard through his bathroom door. Mr. Knopf thanked him for all the trouble he was taking, and felt sure that he and Mr. Shipman would soon recover possession of their diamonds, thanks to the persevering detective. He, 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 laughed the man in the corner. Poor Mr. Howard. He persevered, but got no further. No, nor anyone else for that matter. Even I might not be able to convict the thieves if I told all I knew to the police. Now, follow my reasoning point by point, he added eagerly. Who knew the presence of the diamonds in the house of Mr. Shipman and Mr. Knopf? Firstly, he said, putting up an ugly claw-like finger, Mr. Shipman, then Mr. Knopf, then, presumably, the man Robertson. And the tramp? said Polly. Leave the tramp alone for the present, since he has vanished, and take point number two. Mr. Shipman was drugged. That was pretty obvious. No man under ordinary circumstances would, without waking, have his keys abstracted and then replaced at his own bedside. Mr. Howard suggested that the thief was armed with some anesthetic. But how did the thief get into Mr. Shipman's room without waking him from his natural sleep? Is it not simpler to suppose that the thief had taken the precaution to drug the jeweler before the latter went to bed? But— Wait a minute and take point number three. Though there was every proof that Mr. Shipman had been in possession of twenty-five thousand pounds worth of goods since Mr. Knopf had a check from him for that amount, there was no proof that in Mr. Knopf's house there was even an odd stone worth a sovereign. And then again, went the scarecrow, getting more and more excited, did it ever strike you or anybody else that at no time, while the tramp was in custody, while all that searching examination was being gone on with, no one ever saw Mr. Knopf and his men Robertson together at the same time? Ah, he continued, while suddenly the young girl seemed to see the whole thing as in a vision. They did not forget a single detail. Follow me with them, point by point. Two cunning scoundrels, geniuses they could be called, well provided with some ill-gotten funds, but determined on a grand coup. They play at respectability, for six months, say. One is the master, the other the servant. They take a house in the same street as their intended victim, make friends with him, accomplish one or two credible but very small business transactions, always drawing on the reserve funds, which might have even amounted to a few hundreds, and a bit of credit. Then the Brazilian diamonds and the Parisians, which, remember, were so perfect that they required chemical testing to be detected. The Parisian stones are sold, not in business, of course, in the evening after dinner and a good deal of wine. Mr. Knopf's Brazilians were beautiful, perfect. Mr. Knopf was a well-known diamond merchant. Mr. Shipman bought, but with the morning would have come sober sense. The check stopped before it could have been presented, the swindler caught. No, those exquisite Parisians were never intended to rest in Mr. Shipman's safe until the morning. That last bottle of forty-eight port, with the aid of a powerful soporific, ensured that Mr. Shipman would sleep undisturbed during the night. Ah, remember all the details, they were so admirable. The letter posted in Brighton by the cunning rogue to himself, the smashed desk, the broken pane of glass in his own house, the man Robertson on the watch, while Knopf himself in ragged clothing found his way into number 26. If Constable D-21 had not appeared upon the scene, that exciting comedy in the early morning would not have been enacted. As it was, in the supposed fight, Mr. Shipman's diamonds passed from the hands of the tramp into those of his accomplice. Then, later on, Robertson, ill in bed while his master was supposed to have returned. By the way, it never struck anybody that no one saw Mr. Knopf come home, though he surely would have driven up in a cab. Then the double part played by one man for the next two days. It certainly never struck either the police or the inspector. Remember, they only saw Robertson when in bed with a streaming cold. But Knopf had to be out of jail as soon as possible. The dual role could not be kept up for long. Hence the story of the diamonds found in the garden of number 22. The cunning rogues guessed that the usual plan would be acted upon, and the suspected thief allowed to visit the scene where his hoard lay hidden. It had all been foreseen, and Robertson must have been constantly on the watch. The tramp stopped, mind you, in Phillimore Terrace for some moments, lighting a pipe. The accomplice then was fully on the alert. He slipped the bolts of the back garden gate. Five minutes later, Knopf was in the house, in a hot bath, getting rid of the disguise of our friend the tramp. Remember that again, here the detective did not actually see him. The next morning Mr. Knopf, black hair and beard and all, was himself again. The whole trick lay in one simple art, which those two cunning rascals knew to absolute perfection, the art of impersonating one another. They are brothers, presumably. Twin brothers, I should say. But Mr. Knopf, 
suggested Polly. Well, look in the trade's directory. You will see F. Knopf and Company, diamond merchants of some city address. Ask about the firm among the trade. You will hear that it is firmly established on a sound financial basis. He, <laughs> and it deserves to be, added the man in the corner, as, calling for the waitress, he received his ticket, and taking up his shabby hat, took himself and his bit of string rapidly out of the room. End of chapter 2